الياسمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي انزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش افضل الانبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا ابي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين اما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو استق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واستعينوا بالصبر والصلاه على كبيره الا على الخاشعين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وال محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in his blessed name and I thank him and I recognize his infinite mercy though our recognition is a drop in the ocean and while we recognize the intense mercy of God we also need to recognize the fact that we have limited free will on this earth and we are empowered to decree our own destiny There's a beautiful story that I share you know briefly on this power of destiny where Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam was leaning on a wall and it was a bit tilted so he looks up the companions are sitting around him and he stands up and moves to another wall and they all follow him and they say ya amirul mu'minin what did you just do we were sitting there you moved he said i moved from one destiny to another so notice there is destiny the destiny is that the law of physics dictates that everything goes towards the gravitational force the center of the earth is pulling things and hence we fall there is this attraction the law of attraction so if you are on a leaning wall and it's weak the law of physics states it will most likely collapse meaning the probability of its collapse is high wisdom dictates don't be underneath it lest you become a victim of that collapse so notice destiny has its powers and it's fixed and if you and i get caught within those powers we may become victims of that destiny So while God has built a fantastic system with our intelligence if we do not avoid the dangers then we may become victims so our limited free will has been empowered for us to avoid and dodge the bullets Allah has enabled us and blessed us with this capacity and I begin in his name for giving us the opportunity to pray to him and to beg from him and i recognize the fact that while he has made this earth transient meaning short lived it's a very short world those of us who are older and those who are older than us if you ask them they will swear that they yesterday they were born they will swear that they that this world was so quick that how did they get to this old age when yesterday there were children running around with agility and now they have slowed down with inabilities so this world is very short even 1000 years when nuh alayhi salam was asked you know he preached for 950 years and malakul maut asked him ya nuh how long have you tarried on this earth how long have you lived he said like moving from the sun into the shade that's how quick this world is so we know that a merciful god having created a spectacular universe a universe you and i will never understand its full scope it's so amazing allah says go look at it farji al basar hal tara min futur thumma arji al basar qarratayn yanqalib ilayk al basar khasim wa hasir go look again do you see any fissures any mistakes in it you will come back tired and dazzled 
It's just, just our universe. We don't know how many such universes exist. And how many creations Allah has created. For Allah continues to create. He never stops creating. What is his treasury like? It is impossible for you and I know, to know. Allah says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مِنْ شَجَرَةِ نَقْلَامٌ وَالْبَحْرُ يَمُدُّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ سَبْعَةُ أَبْحُرٍ مَا نَفِذَتْ كَلِمَاتُ اللَّهِ Were you to take all the trees on this earth, and there are millions and billions of trees, and make them into pens, أَقْلَامٌ وَالْبَحْرُ يَمُدُّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ سَبْعَةُ أَبْحُرٍ You take all the seas and add seven more seas, you will not cease to mention the glory of God. I begin in His name. And you and I exist in this glory. And we have been granted this world where He is so merciful, yet this world is so short and quick. And yet it is so slippery. It is filled with evil forces. Because Allah allowed it to practice it. Allah gave the human being the free will to practice. And there is so much evil in the world. Humankind is good at, in general. But when leadership is evil, when the system allows evil to penetrate the masses, it becomes status quo. It becomes normalized. Haram becomes halal. You see? And because everybody does it, sometimes for some of us it becomes wajib. Because everybody is doing it, I have to do it. And it's because these distractions cause us to fall, to escape the very trial. Yesterday a brother came to me and was saying to me, that very beautiful brother said, I'm not sure if I believe in God. And when I was talking to him, I said, you're a gamer, aren't you? You game. He said, I do. How do you know that? I said, let's not go there. I said, you're not very social, are you? He said, no. So you want to know why? I said, yeah. I said, you can't control this world. You have found too much evil in this world. It's precarious. There's no stability. It lacks trust. It's fluid. It's shifting colors. Like camouflage. Like a chameleon changing colors. And children get confused. How do I hold on firmly? I said, you found something to hold on to that gives you control. It's called the joystick. He said, subhanAllah, you nailed it. I said, yeah, that's why you're doing that. It's a different world, but you control it. You can move it, you can stop it. You can speed it, you can slow it. You can decide to do what you want. Why do kids go there? They have lost faith in the real world. That's why you notice our children are indulging in that area of the world. When in fact, Allah says, take control of your life. Alaykum anfusakum. Mankind, how far will you run? Where will you go? And I see such beautiful youth like the one I was talking to yesterday. Beautiful, pure at the heart. They're looking at you. They wouldn't harm an insect. But they're telling us, what else is left? For the world has beguiled us, it cheats us, it lies to us, even from the home, when parents are bickering and fighting on petty issues. Children lose hope. Then when it doesn't work, they're frustrated, they become self-destructive with the intent to indulge in any kind of thing that will release their tension. Something that can give me some level of control. The real control, brothers and sisters, is reflection meditation. Real control is dua. Real control 
is to meet the bull by the horns after that and bring it down the way Amir al Mu'mineen, the way Rasulullah, the center of the leadership of the universe for the human race is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. So these, tonight I want to speak about the power of dua. How should we pray? For if we know how to pray, we're going to be in control of prayer. Allah says, Ad'uni astajib lakum. Wa qala rabbukum ad'uni astajib lakum. God has said, ask me, I will reply you. Many of us have lost faith in asking. Allah says, inna ladina istakbiruna an ibadat. Those who are too arrogant to remember this, we will punish them. Meaning, they're going to create an alternative world because they do not feel that praying to God has any meaning because it hasn't worked. We need to know how to pray. And I love the fact that Allah doesn't just give us what we want in our foolish ways and instantly, you know, you pray to God, give me gold, boom, gold pops up. I hate that person, let him die. Boom, that person dies. Alhamdulillah, that doesn't happen. Can you imagine what would happen if it happened that way? Oh my God, none of us would be existing. We'd all be the first one to get rid of each other. Like Allah, get rid of all of them first. Alhamdulillah, that when we pray, Allah says, I give you what is best for you. So the first foundation is to know the meaning of life. We're not here to waste our time. We're not here to grow old. We're not here to occupy space and eat and be a massive body of some sort and be a statistic on some radar. We're here for a reason. Rabbana ma khalaqtaha da batilan. Subhanaka faqin adab an nar. My Lord, our Lord, you did not make this in vain. This world is too valuable. When people ask me that question, that I don't know if God exists. I ask them, do you believe in truth and falsehood? Do you believe in good versus evil? They said, yes. I said, where in science can you derive that? Which science teaches you good versus evil? All of science is good. There is no science that is evil. There's no such thing. So how do you learn the difference between good and evil? For science doesn't have any form of adjudicating a methodology of halal and haram and mustahab and mubah and makru, as we call ahkamul khamsa, the five laws of God, where every transaction you and I do come under these five laws, wajib, haram, mustahab, makru, and mubah. Five rules. Wajib, you must do it. Haram, you must avoid it. Mustahab, recommended to do it. Makru, it is better you avoid it. And Mubah, it doesn't matter whether you do it or not. This is the law of God. Where do you derive that? In science? You cannot. It cannot be derived in physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics. There is no such thing where one can derive haram from halal in empirical sciences. Anyone who comes to you and says science is the mother of all, tell them that why are the ethical bodies the ethicists dictating research in universities? Why is it that the ethical body tells the research institutions what they can do that's ethical and what they cannot do which is not ethical? If science is the mother of all, they should be dictating the ethicists on what is halal and haram. Why the reverse? I speak about this in universities all the time. And everybody's stunned by it. I said, then why do we teach our children that the axis of humanity is science when it is only a methodology of observing the broader spectrum of the human existence? It's a false statement to say that science is at the center of the universe. It's not. There's an ethical body of halal and haram. At the end of the day, the buck stops between our relationship when we cheat each other, when we are honest with each other, when we are kind to each other versus when we are harsh to each other. When we are trustworthy versus when we are not trustworthy. I don't care how rich we are, how powerful we are, how tall we are, how short we are, what land we were born on. All of those become inconsequential when the ethical matters are violated or upheld. Isn't it true? So how is ethics managed? 
Who gives us such ethics? If not a divine being from God, can you and I make ethics? If we do, it's bankrupt. The idea of a 51% vote is nonsense. If we decide to become cannibals, God forbid, and we have a 51% vote that humans taste better than anything else, God forbid, it becomes halal. And let us say, we say not eating humans is forbidden. Now we just made it haram, not to eat you. How ridiculous. If we say Hitler had a majority of Germans figure out that the Aryan race was superior to other races and therefore they needed to go out there and cleanse the gene, the gene pool and get rid of anyone who was non-Aryan and they had a majority within their land and then their expansion that led to World War II particularly one can argue from an ethical relativistic point of view that what they did was not wrong because they had a majority vote. But any human being in their proper mind will tell you that intrinsically it is evil to even consider such an ideology that means that morality cannot be adjudicated by any human being, by any standard, except to submit to it and to promote it and to forbid that which is immoral. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So then God has to give it to us. Allah says, وَالَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَطْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ He it is who sent prophets from among yourselves. وَالَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَطْلُ عَلَيْهِ آيَاتِ They recited the signs. They showed you the signs. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Purified you. وَيُعَلِّمْهُمُ الْكِتَابِ Taught you the law and gave you wisdom. وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ And before this, you were in darkness. You knew there is a God somewhere out there. But we didn't know what it is, how it is. We just know there's a force out there. How do I transact with it? What do I do with it? Let us say when I believe in God, how do I... Worship God. Do I need to worship? What form of worship is essential? What should I do? What should I not do? People experimented thinking that worship was to sacrifice children. The Aztecs used to take one human being and tear their hearts out and give it to the gods because they thought that's what's going to appease the gods. They would bury their children. They would sacrifice and murder and cause all kinds of mayhem to please the gods. When Allah says, when kanum in qablu, who gave you this mad idea of killing each other for the sake of God? Sacrificing each other for the sake of God. God creates everything. He doesn't need such sacrifice. When we sacrifice an animal, it is not to kill an animal. It is to feed the poor and the hungry. So Allah says, I teach you. If you experiment, you won't know what to do. So prophets came to teach us and to guide us methodically, villages upon villages. Allah says every community has received messengers. Every community has received guidance. And Allah promises us that we only punish those communities that have received guidance. And Allah says every community has been. So therefore the potential of punishment, should we be reckless in our morality, is subject to question. Look, if you and I were wronged, some of us have gone to court to stand in front of a judge. It depends on what judge you get, what mood they're in, and sadly, what gender they are. Sometimes you'll hear a lawyer say, oh, she's a woman. Her judgment is going to be like that. Oh, he's a man. Her, his I'm thinking like, wow, judge justice is depending on who it is, what his background is, what his gender is. Oh my God. Is this real justice? And then the judge sits there looking at you. He may not like you. Maybe the way you're dressed. That's why you have noticed even murderers, they come with nice suits and ties. They sit in front of the jury to look decent. So that we can let them know, hey, I'm not so bad. You could be a serial killer. Come with a suit. You don't look so serial anymore. And that judge now is like, hmm. And then the jury's scratching their head. I don't know. Guilty? Not guilty? What do you think? Hmm? 
And then you find these, sometimes murderers get away, sometimes innocent people are incarcerated because of their skin color. And sadly, the darker their skin color, the more the chance of them going to jail. Like, what a world we live in. And then you hope that when you get accused, that you can bring some evidence forward and lack thereof, puts you sometimes in a quandary, puts you in a very precarious situation. You don't know. And you're letting this judge know, I'm innocent. But that just says, I don't know. I wasn't there. So my God, I want justice. We all want justice. Even when we go watch movies. Do you ever notice there's always a good guy or a good group and a bad group? Always. Hollywood is not a religious organization, you know. It manipulates our minds. But why is there always a good guy or a good group and a bad guy and a bad group? We just love it. Because it's all about morals. At the end of the day, it's all about morals. Who's the good one? Now, Hollywood is not a religious institution. You will rarely ever find anything. Even in a documentary, you and I are looking for the good stuff. Oh yeah, that was a good person. See, he was honest. Look, when they interviewed him and her. You see, she was very honest. Oh, that one was wretched. I didn't like that one. Don't trust that one. We're always constantly, when we make friends, same thing. When we make, when we see, even here, when I'm standing up here, you're all judging. Is he a good guy? bad guy? Is he like fooling us? <laughs> like, hey, I don't know. What do you think? huh? Well, keep thinking. <laughs> so what are we doing? Constantly judging, judging, judging. Every single day. At what level? Whether we have huge cars and huge houses. That's secondary. At the end of the day, is this person true? Is he really saying what he means? Subhanallah. But here's the most amazing part. Every movie, when there's a good guy and a bad guy, in the end of the movie, if the good guy doesn't win, it's a sequel. You just can't handle it. Like what? The evil superseded? Oh, there's got to be a part two to this one. <laughs> just can't be. Like what's going on? Well, maybe it's the end of the movie. No. If that's like, I, I hate this movie. I'll never watch it again. Why? The bad guy won. You know, life is full of probabilities. 50-50. Sometimes the good wins. You've heard of the yin and the yang, right? You know, sometimes good guy wins, sometimes bad guy wins. So this movie was the bad guy won. Leave it alone. Go bury it. Go to sleep. No. I can't handle this. Don't ever show me a movie where the bad guy wins. You hurt my feeling. You hurt my conscience. What are you trying to tell me? Bad is good? But we love it when the good guy wins. Especially the end, you know. They, they bring something out and boom. You get rid of the bad person. Ah, alhamdulillah. We're all cheering. You notice we all love justice. We love that the end should be good. Allah in the Quran says, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُطْئِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّ وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ It is our desire to make you oppressed people, the leaders of this world, and you will be the inheritors of this world. Allah promises us. Allah says, I did not create this in vain. Even in your fitrah, even in your own conscience, you know that justice should prevail. But how will it prevail if there is no being that sees everything? How will I stand on judgment day and produce evidence to God? And let's say I don't have it. It got destroyed in a storm. And I'm standing on judgment day. Allah says, so are you good or bad? Well, I had all this data that was good God, but it got lost in the way when I got it buried. What a disastrous existence. Allah says, وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى you will see even a subatomic particle of deed and thought. You will see it on that day. Wallahu basirun bima ta'amalun. Qul inna al mawta alladhi tafirruna minhu fa innahu mulaqikum thumma turadduna ila alim al ghaybi wa shahadati fa yunabbi'ukum bima kuntum ta'amalun. How beautiful! Allah says the death that you run away from, it will meet you. And you will come in front of the one who is your witness. What a beautiful verse. God says, don't worry. 
You know, Luqman yesterday was I was mentioning. Says, Ya bunna ya inna ha inta kumith qala habbatin min khadalin fatakun fi sakhratin aw fi samawati aw fi al-ardi yati biha Allah. My son, you split the rock, sky, earth. God knows. Allah latifun khabir. God is ever aware. Isn't that beautiful? You have a judge who sees everything and justice will be met in its fullest form and yet it will be completely wrapped in the mercy of God. For God is oft forgiving and says that you have slipped many a times but I will expose it to you and your organs will talk. You don't even need to be asked a question. Your tongue, your heart, your hands, your eyes Everything will talk and it will expose you to the fullest. And Allah says, then I will judge you as to where you really stand. And you will see how merciful I am. But if you work hard against me and you work using those gifts that I have given you to cause mischief on this earth and to cause harm and damage and destruction to the progress of God's mercy, then Allah says, we will punish you with a severe punishment. Allah has made a calling. If you're grateful, I will give you more. If you're ungrateful, I will punish you. But look at the whole system. There is a higher authority looking at us, guiding us, holding us. So when someone asks, I'm not sure about God, ask them, how do you answer the moral question? Where is it? If it's haphazard and random, then if I can commit a crime that I don't get arrested for, it's not a bad deed. If I steal and there's no one to catch me and I grow old and I die with it and I gained benefit, then it's really not a bad deed, though I stole, God forbid. So notice, morality goes bankrupt when there is no God. Morality goes bankrupt when there is no overseer. Morality goes bankrupt when there is no day of judgment. Morality goes bankrupt when you and I don't hold ourselves liable. Every piece of the equation starts to fall apart. So if you and I have any doubts about the existence of God and the mercy that he has placed upon us, including the duties that you and I have to perform, then let's start thinking deeper because if you and I have missed that part, then we have missed the greatest thing in existence. For then we will run to joysticks, we will run to drugs, we will run to alcohol, we will run to gambling because we won't know what else to do. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. So I want to establish something very simple. How do we pray? There's a beautiful book by Sayyid Mushtaba. Uh, Lari, say Mushtaba Musawi Lari. It's free, available online. It's called Hidden Truths in Quran. Download it, read it. It's very succinct, to the point. It's very simple. And there's another book I would advise you to read. An excellent book. Some youth came yesterday and said, Brother, how do I understand the history of Karbala better? Is there an analysis that will enable me to understand the gravity of this event so that I can understand it better? There's a beautiful book called A Probe into the History of Ashura by Dr. Ibrahim Ayati. Read that book. It's a masterpiece in my opinion. It's freely available on al-islam.org. It's a PDF. Read it. I've had people, even from other schools of thought, read this and they were stunned. They said we couldn't put it down for the exposure and the events are so beautifully laid out about how the Umayyads and the Hashimi, Banu Hashim, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, Imam Hussein Ali what was the scenario that took Imam where he went? Why did the Imam do what he did? And he exposes all the most salient comments of Imam Hussein Ali to pro, to basically expose to the world why this revolution is so important. Please, I advise us all, please, if you've got time, read it. Read it, study it, understand it. It will give us strength to understand the values of life. For there's no greater strength when we pray than when we are knowledgeable, when we understand the meaning of why we exist. Let's not be oblivious. Let's not be, as they say in Arabic, ghafil, you know? Let's not be reckless. Let's not be by the day. If we're impulsive, and society controls us, we are going to be the collateral damage, I promise us. But when you and I hold on to the rope of Allah, we will dodge the bullets. 
And even if it hits us, we will die shaheed because we are in the pursuit of knowledge. We're in the pursuit of truth. So how should we pray? Simple principle. Allah created us to take us to higher stations. I'm simplifying it. Allah created us not for this world. None of us were created for this world. Even the Holy Prophet has stated that who builds a house on a bridge? Oh companions, have you seen somebody who builds a house on a bridge? And the companion says, no, Ya Rasulullah, no. He says, this world is a bridge. Our existence, we're on a bridge crossing the real world. Don't build your permanent homes here. Build it in the next world. Use this world as a means for the next world. Al-mal wal-banoon, zinatul hayat al-dunya, wal-baqiyatul salihat, khayrun inda rabbika thawaban, wa khayrun amala. The wealth, mal wal-banoon, is the beauty of this world. Zinatul hayat al-dunya. What's left are your good deeds. That is most honorable to God. And that is what will remain. The Prophet said, there are three friends you have. It, he said, how sad the world is busy making friends with the first two. And they have ignored the third. So the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, who are these three friends? He said, your wealth and your family are your best friends today, you mankind. Whereas your good deeds is the real friend. So the Prophet said, let me explain. The first friend will buy your grave and your coffin. After that, your first friend can do nothing for you. It's amazing when you examine a person who's extremely wealthy. I remember Malcolm Forbes was a billionaire, the owner of the Forbes magazine. He used to fly his friends to his island just for vacations. That's how rich he was. When he was on his deathbed, he's telling the doctor, cure me. I have this sickness, I'm going to die. I'll give you more money. Can't. There's nothing you can do. And when you die, you're going to leave everything behind. And others are going to use it. And you're going to be examined for it. Accounting is on you. Imam Ali alayhi salam does that too. He's riding on a horse from a battle. He comes to the graveyard. He says, Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al qubur Peace be upon you, O people of the grave. The companion says, Amir al-Mu'mineen, what are you talking about? He says, no, no, they hear me. They hear me. Regarding those women that you were chasing, they have been remarried to other men. Regarding the wealth you were hoarding, it has been distributed. What is the khabar down there now? Brilliant. True. This audience could be an entirely non-Muslim audience. They would have to nod. They say, true. There's nothing you and I can argue about that. Al-mal wal banoon. So the Prophet said, your money will buy you your gr grave and your shroud. Your second friend will wash you, wrap you, and bury you. There is nothing else your friends can do. Your family and your friends will feel sorry for you. They'll make fatiha, they'll do sabu, they'll feed people. But after that, it's not going to help you. They'll pray for you, but trust me, if you were against Allah, no prayer will come handy because it's buck stops with you. What did you want? Allah says, Wal salihat. What's left are your deeds. The Prophet said, Your third friend are your good deeds. He said, Most of mankind has ignored the third friend, thinking the first two gives them security. When in fact it's a third friend that comes with you in the grave, stays with you, protects you, grows with you forever. But many of us say, no, a bird in one hand is better than ten in the bush. <laughs> this is exactly how the Bani Umayyah did. He says, we've got him. We've got Hussein ibn Ali. We've been promised. Imam says to Umar ibn Sa'ad, you won't even eat the wheat from Ray. The governorship they promised you, you will not become the governor there, nor will you eat their food. Imam says to Ibn Ziyad, he has built a white palace in Basra. He won't sleep one night in it. He has been promised, shaitan fooled him. 
and he thinks he's going to get it. But he's going to be damned and doomed fi dunya wal akhirah for the evils that he's committing on this earth. And so true the story. Umar ibn Sa'd never became governor and he never ate the wheat from that land. And Ibn Ziyad, who orchestrated this whole battle under the command of Yazid, runs away and doesn't even sleep one night in the white palace he built in Basra. Because Imam said, they promise you, but it's a lie. Allah calls you towards grace, but you reject. So his deeds are nullified with dunya wal akhirah. God forbid you and I are in that state. God forbid, I swear. So Allah created us to be good on this earth. And it's a world filled with trials. Now there are two ways. Allah says, We guided you to two paths. This is deep. When you understand it, you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries us in positives and in negatives. Sometimes it's wealth, power, honor comes your way. And sometimes it's tribulation, loss, fear, negatives versus positives. Usually we get a mixture of both. As Imam Ali alayhi salam says, every human being has two days. One is for you, one is against you. When it's for you, be grateful, embrace yourself, for around the corner shall come a trial upon you. And when it's bad, then be patient and hope for around the corner is good news. That's the way we should live. Now, those of us who've left God or lost faith in God because we've prayed, it hasn't been accepted, it's a trial upon us. And God is sharpening us and says, are you patient? That's why Allah says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 45. Hold on. وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ إِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ Indeed. See? It's difficult. It's very difficult. Except those who are humble. Then, it's not difficult. So if we and I, you and I don't sit and reflect and know the value of life, we become a burden on others. You find marriages are constantly clashing because each side is demanding. There is no thought to look at that other person and say, how much can I give? How can I be a caring, sharing, loving human being instead of constantly demanding? Marriages are breaking. Relationships are breaking. Children and adults are fighting. We're all demanding, demanding, demanding. We forgot it's a temporary world. Everything you and I demanding is going to perish. كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذِي الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ The only thing that remains is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our deeds remain forever with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we don't believe in it. I've seen it. When you do marriage counseling for petty things, you have an axe to grind, vendetta, anger, vengeance. I need to punish you forever. And then they go into ruku. Allah, Allah, astaghfirullah, Rabbi, wa atubu Allah says, you could not forgive your own brother. You come and ask me for istighfar. That's why salah doesn't get accepted under these what we demand. When we pray to God, God give me. Allah says, have you understood the meaning of why you're asking? Have you fixed yourself? Have you become merciful? He says, oh Allah, then make me merciful. Allah says, okay. So I test you with trials and tribulations. Let's see. Now here's the Najdain, the two systems. You'll find that in positives and in negatives, when you know the way Allah works, the only solution is to think positive. When you lose, say, Alhamdulillah, I lost. But you lost. It's okay. Sometimes I need to lose to gain something bigger. Oh, I gained. Alhamdulillah, I gained. Now I must distribute, for this must be a trial upon me, for I've been given more than I deserve. I must give it back. Many a times people come and say, MashaAllah, what a nice project. So what's next? I said, that's a nice question. How about you say it's a nice project, so what can I do with you next? No, 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 you, what's next for you? I'm just watching, you see. I'm going to come and pat you on your back and say, MashaAllah, MashaAllah, beautiful job you've done. What's next, Hajj? So what? Like you've reached nirvana, karma, you're like in paradise now? You're just watching us little peons do good things and you're patting us on the back? How about you? 
No, 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 no. <laughs> Me? I'm too busy. You know what a prayer is? Prayer is that you ask Allah, my Lord, you are very wise. You created me when I didn't exist. You shaped me when I didn't know. You taught me when I was ignorant. You guide me and I don't know where I'm going. You've got my destiny set. You have promised me a hereafter and you've created me for paradise. By the way, none of us were created for hell. We take ourselves to hell. God does not create any creation for hell. None. Allah created us for paradise. This conversation is how do we work hard to get to the high stations of paradise. Very important. And at the same time, how can we avoid our stupidity and foolishness and arrogance and ignorance lest we go towards hell? This is this conversation about. It's very hopeful. But the foundation states, Ya Allah, you created me, you fashioned me, you know me better than I know me. So God says, I want you to be, be good. You are the best in the community. You promote good, you forbid evil. Ya Allah, what is that? How much good should I do? How much should I fight evil? Guide me, my Lord. Now your prayer starts to work. When you pray to God, you see? When you pray this way and you say, Oh Allah, you decide what I should get. And when you make your dua, you keep it generic and grand with no specific details. For example, childish people will say, I really like that Fulan bin Fulan. Ya Allah, I'm in love with that Fulan bin Fulan or Fulan binti Fulan. I want her. I want her. I want him. I want them to be mine. I want them to love me. So he said, Ya Wadud, Ya Wadud. Oh God, please put love between us. When I walk on the streets, please God, have a look at me. I will be so happy, God, I'll worship you forever. It's the wrong kind of dua. <laughs> wrong. Don't ever go there. Please. It's very childish. I remember one time I saw a four-year-old kid, girl sitting there frowning. I went to her and said, why are you frowning? She left me as my friend. I said, oh, but I'm your friend. Really? She said, yeah. Can I be your friend? She said, yeah. I said, okay, let's be friends. But of course, in her mind, she says, you're too old for me. <laughs> but you get the point. Childish. She left me. She said that, but oh, I want to die. There is no God. I want to stop praying now. Khalas, that's it. I'm done. I'm done with deen. That's it. This childish form of prayer is many of us praying this way. Ya Allah, I want this. Ya Allah, I want that. Give me this. If you don't give me this, why is my friend better? Why, why does he have a better house than my... Hey, look in the mirror for God's sakes. Look how beautiful you are. Look how gifted you are. If you had a billion dollars and it cost a half a billion to get your eye back, one eye, you'd give it in a heartbeat. And if you, and you, if you lost both eyes and it took a billion dollars to get both eyes, you'd give it in a heartbeat. You already have it. But no, the grass is always greener on the other side. And I demand and I demand. I ask us all, when we go to pray to Allah, first recognize the gift He's already given us so we don't bargain with Him. God, I'm going to pray to you, but you've got to give me the following. Allah says, come and ask me, but not with conditions. I've already given you too much. What are you doing with it? Why don't you ask from me to give you more so that you can do more good? The way Zakaria said, Yarithuni wa yarithumin ali Yaqub. Give me an inheritor so that we become leaders who bring good children forward to represent you. This is the kind of prayer we should say. Ya Allah, make me honest. Look at Ibrahim after he built the Kaaba. Rabbi ja'alni muqeema salati wa min dhurriyati. Our Lord, make us among the prayerful and our children. That kind of prayer, Allah immediately replies. This is why many a times our duas are not accepted. Rather than saying, Ya Allah, make me a good person, let's not be petty. 
And I'll show you what pettiness is about. Sayyid Mushtab Alari in the same book states that Allah never refused the prayer of prophets except one. And that one was not because he made a mistake. That was Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. When Nuh alayhi salam was on the ark, he saw his son drowning. Fatherly call, a fatherly call, fatherly love. That the son is a disbeliever, a rejecter, a troublemaker. But he's rejecting Allah. Nuh is praying to Allah, save my son. Allah says he is not from you, leave him. Subhanallah, how amazing. A prophet is praying. Allah says, my standards are built on principles. When they are built on principles, ask me anything and I'll give you so much you never imagined possible. This is the kind of prayer you and I should be doing. Every dua, even if you read, for example, listen to this. It's amazing. When you read even Dua Makarimul Akhlaq by Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. We, I encourage our children and adults, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, please read Dua Makarimul Akhlaq. It's the highest moral traits we're asking from Allah, written by Imam Zain al Abidin. And the amazing fact is he wrote it after Karbala. I'll talk about the wisdom and the brilliance of a man who witnessed his family massacred, yet he spent 34 years writing Dua and guiding humanity. As a legacy, you and I would have condemned God for our children being killed on a battlefield. But instead of condemning, he's done nothing but greater good. This is the deen of God that we're talking about. In Dua Kumail, he says, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi rahmatika allati wasi'at kulla shay. Listen to the dua. Everything is generic. Listen to it. Okay. Wa bi quwwatika allati qaharta biha kulla shay. Wa khada'a laha kulla shay. Wa dalla laha kulla shay. وَبِجَبَرُوتِكَ الَّتِي غَلَبْتَ بِهَا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ وَبِعِزَّتِكَ الَّتِي لَا يَقُومُ لَهَا شَيْءٍ وَبِعَظَمَتِكَ الَّتِي مَلَأَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ وَبِسُلْطَانِكَ الَّذِي عَلَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Every verse, listen to this, dua, listen to how it starts. Oh Allah, I ask you by your mercy, which embraces all things. I ask you by your mercy and by your strength which dominates all things. Look, you're making dua, but you're acknowledging usul. You're acknowledging God. You're giving him the proper due. As Allah says, وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Struggle in the way of your Lord, the way he deserves it. This is the struggle. You're acknowledging my Lord. I recognize you are the master. I come to you. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِينَ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ How universal is it? Guide me on the path of those you have chosen. Not those who invoke your wrath. And not those who are lost. Look how universal and generic it is. We read this 10 times a day. Is there any specific in it? No. We're saying to God, you bring me the specifics. I stick by these basic laws. He says, Allah, I ask you by the which embraces all things. And by your strength, which dominates all things. And towards which all things are humble. And before which all things are low. And by your invincibility, through which you overwhelm all things, and by your might, which nothing can resist, and by your tremendousness, which has filled all things, by your force, which towers over all things, and by your face, which submits of the annihilation of all things, and by your names, which have filled the foundation of all things, and by your knowledge, and by the light of your face, continue, continue, continue. Then we're asking, forgive me for the sins, my Lord, which tear apart my safeguards. Allahumma fil ya dunubalati. Allah, forgive me those sins which draw down adversities. Forgive me those sins which, are, which alter my blessings. Forgive me those sins which hold back my dua, my prayer. Forgive me those sins which cut down hopes. Forgive me those sins which draw down tribulations. Forgive me every sin I have committed and every mistake I have made. Look how beautiful it is. So I conclude tonight with this dua. Amazing dua, as you see this. And we see when Imam Hussain is in Karbala, the same thing. But before I go there, you find, and I'll talk more about it. As you know, tomorrow night is our night of Ashura. We will not be having a lecture during the day. But after tomorrow night, uh, many centers here are offering those services in the afternoon. Please join them and, and do the a'mal and so on. But 
So tomorrow I will read the shahada of Imam Hussain alayhi salam in the night time. And I'll talk tomorrow about tawakkal, particularly and about how do we reach a stage where we're able to sacrifice ourselves the way Imam Hussain alayhi salam was able to do when Allah says they go with no fear and they kill and they get killed. How? How do we reach that? It's not difficult. And what that is a metaphor, by the way, it doesn't mean we go on the battlefield. Every day we work at work, in the house, in the family, it's a battlefield. How do I win against evil forces every single hour? Tonight, just a simple example. You find the companions of the cave. They had tawakkal al Allah. They prayed to Allah. And Allah says, Am hasibta anna ashab al kahfi wal raqeem kanu min ayatina ajaba id awal fitiyatu ila al kahfi faqalu rabbana atina min ladunka rahma wa hayyi lana min amrina rashada. I'm speeding on this quickly because my time is almost ending. But I want to remind us, these youth that were going to be killed by a Roman king of the time because they didn't worship him as a god. And they said, we won't. We refuse. We won't worship you. They said, then I will kill you and crucify you and burn you. They didn't know what to do. So they turned to God. Allah says, have you taken account of how great they are? Huh? Ajaba. There, is it not ajeeb? Have you not seen? They prayed to me. Rabbana atina min ladun karahm. Our Lord, give us from your treasury. Give us from your wealth. And make our affairs right. We don't know. We don't know what to do. Guide us. When you and I pray, ask Allah, guide us. Even if we get massacred, as it happened in Karbala, it's a success. Because when you get killed under those premises, you become the flag of God forever. You become the spirit that's keeping us alive today. We are here in this gathering tonight. Hundreds of millions of people on earth tonight are gathered tonight to commemorate this incredible event because they gave their souls to maintain a positive movement that is so positive that the evil forces of the world fears Ashura. They are afraid of these nights. They know that the grand revolution that's going to bring justice and peace is going to come through these events of Karbala. So Allah put them to sleep for 300 years. They didn't know. They woke up and they were younger than their five generations forward. Allah said, did you see that? They prayed to me to make their affairs right. So I made it right. They didn't ask me to sleep for 300 years. I gave it to them. You and I, brothers and sisters, should make dua all the time. And whenever problems come, take it positive. Something good comes, take it positive. Somebody denies you something, take it positive. Somebody compliments you, take it positive. Live nothing but by positive rights and see how high the stages you will reach, inshallah. Tonight, that positive behavior of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. That after all the companions have been killed, his family members have been killed, Abbas alayhi salam has been shaheed, Ali Akbar is shaheed, Qasim is shaheed, all his family members are shaheed. Hmm? Their bodies are strewn on the field. He hears Imam is getting ready to go and they are waiting, thirsty to kill him, eager to get the money from Ibn Ziyad, from Yazid, eager. And they were going to fight as to who was going to take the head of Imam Hussain. They were going to fight as to who was going to take his ring and his finger. Can you imagine how sad it is? Imam is standing looking at this world that has turned its face. Yesterday, he was in Medina as the prince of Arabia. The prophet used to carry him on his shoulders and he would ride him. He would kiss him lip to lip. He says, Al Hassan wal Hussein, Sayyid Shabab Alil Jannah. Al Hassan and Hussein are the leaders of the youth in paradise. That today it has come to a point where the women are in a tent, unable to go to the water. And the Imam is trapped, and all his companions are butchered, and the army has surrounded, ready to kill him. He's deciding, what one more good can I do before I leave this world? That was the wisdom of Hussein ibn Ali. He hears his baby, six month baby, Abdullah Radhi, known as Ali al Asghar. His mother Rabab is holding him, 
trying to console this baby because the baby is so thirsty it cannot stop to cry to the extent that it got tired to cry it lost energy to cry Imam turns towards her you know Rabab Allahu Akbar may Allah make our women like Rabab what a strong woman she gave two children to him Ruqayya and Abdullah and both died soon after one in Karbala one shortly after in Damascus in prison Ruqayya died at, a four, at the age of four and she saw both of them die in the most tragic ways and she refused to go back to Medina this mother of Abdullah Radi refused to go back to Medina when she came back to Karbala she pitched a tent and she said I'm not going back to Medina I'm going to sit here and I'm going to tell every caravan that passes this region what the enemies of God have done against the Han. she was a powerful woman and she became Shahida there he's holding this baby Imam comes to her and says give it to me give this baby to me give him to me Imam puts his tongue and tries to quench the thirst of this baby whose tongue is sticking out dry a six-month baby denied water how wretched was the enemy the trial is tough I asked the question Ya Allah would I maintain my faith towards you under that trial Allah says my real agents I put them in the most difficult situations they never turn away from me this is why we love Imam Hussein so much not because he's only Imam Hussein but my God in the annals of history we've never found a human being under this condition to be so steadfast he said let me invoke from the enemy some compassion for they seem to have forgotten it so he says to the mother give him to me let me take him towards this enemy and let me invoke some compassion to them you know Imam is checking off everything in Karbala and says tomorrow if anybody has a question about the integrity of my truthfulness and the evilness of the other side you will not be able to overturn this argument he takes the baby he comes out in front of the enemy he says you are all jealous of me my father you know they were jealous of Amir al-Mu'mineen that jealousy continues until today in the world these enemies who hate anybody who has the name Ali or who's a lover of Ali they want to kill you or Fatima or Zahra that jealousy is in the Quran are you jealous of what we have given some beings on this earth that jealousy continues until today and we practice in our communities too please give it up Imam says what have I done to you have I harmed you have I challenged you? They were kind. Even Ibn Muljim, who strikes Imam Ali alayhi salam, when they capture him, they tie his hand with tightness. Imam says, loosen the rope, it is hurting him. This is the man who killed him. That's the, the, the mercy of our representatives of God. That's the compassion you and I need to have. He takes his baby in front of me enemies and he places it's okay you don't like me you don't like my father what wrong has this child done to you what harm has he brought to you if you think that I will drink this water and maybe I will have some satisfaction don't give it to me just feed the baby let him be satisfied look him I want to do good while he wants to save his child he wants to save the enemy and the army starts to look and says that's a valid argument I mean we've cornered him he's alone 
and they start to have a little compassion. Ibn Sa'd, the Mal'oon, Mal'oon sees that. He is trying to impress the Caliph. So he wants to be Arsh. Like me, some of us, we do haram to, to impress others. So he looks at Hormala. Hormala was an archer. He was a very, very good archer. He would hit his targets very accurately. He looks at Hormala from a distance and says, silence him. While the Imam is talking, he's holding this baby in his arms. He's giving them advice. And an arrow comes in that direction. And it strikes the neck of this little child and it shrieks. <laughs> and then there's silence. And the arrow strikes the little neck. You know how small a neck it is? At the speed, it cannot stop. It goes and punctures the arm of Imam Hussein. And Imam is bleeding. <laughs> Instead of feeding this child, they replied with an arrow. I swear, that arrow lives in my heart. Every time I see an enemy come in front of me who's against Ahl al-Bayt, that arrow talks to me and says, Rise, don't allow that arrow to hit you again. Hold on and fight back and beat this enemy. Imam takes this child, lifeless. Rabab is by the tent looking. <laughs> what mother can watch her child die like that? Tell me what mother can watch that child die? Imam comes back and says, Inna lillaha wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ridham bi qada wa tasliman li amri. We are from Allah and we return to Allah. And we are satisfied by your decree, O oh Allah. Then he turns back, he says, Inna lillah wa inna he Seven times historians say, he came way back and forth. Inna lillah. Imam is showing the enemy. This is what life is about. You will kill me, but you will not kill our spirit. Imam goes by the tents. <laughs> And he digs a little grave with his sword. <laughs> he takes this baby and puts it into the shallow hole. The enemies watch him do that. Rabab is watching. Mother who's torn, but satisfied. Was ta'inu bi sabri was salah. Be patient, it's okay. Allah is going to elevate you to very high stations for this sacrifice. Historians say after Imam Hussein became Shaheed, the enemies came and they dug up that grave. <laughs> and they took the baby out and took its head and put it on a sphere and took it to his feet. <laughs> وَسَيَعْلَمُ <laughs> السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاي أبا الفضل العباس وأختك زينب وبنتك رقية جميعا شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته My brothers Let's sit a few minutes for the Tmiyat Salat.
لا حب الحسين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد If you guys can please um, when I say Ya Mawla you guys can say after me Ya Mahdi please يا حجة الله شكوانا إليك يا حجة الله شكوانا إليك أدركنا أدركنا لبيك لبيك أدركنا أدركنا لبيك لبيك يا حجة الله شكوانا إليك يا حجة الله أدركنا أدركنا لبيك لبيك أدركنا أدركنا لبيك 